Um, I'm going to uh, open us up in a word of prayer. Uh, and uh, what I'll do is uh, just to help everybody to uh, hear everybody. Well, I'll mute everybody right now. And then when we get to the end, uh, I'll open it up. And then uh, if you got questions and stuff like that, you can uh, we'll have a question uh, answer time and all that good stuff. So let me uh, let me always open us up in prayer and then uh, we'll get started. So let me pray. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for an opportunity to uh, come virtually uh, to uh, learn and grow. Uh, I pray that you would bless this time. I pray that you would help us. Uh, I pray that you would even touch the technology. Uh, we know it's not always the most reliable thing, uh, Lord, but uh, we thank you that uh, this is a, a great uh, tool that we can use uh, in this moment to uh, continue to study your word. Uh, Father, I pray for those who are hurting right now. I pray for those who are sick, that you would heal their bodies. Uh, Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody. So we're going to be, uh, for the next uh, several weeks, we're going to be studying and going through the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, it's a great book to walk through, especially in this time of, um, of really unrest, uh, or even like uh, within the local church as well. Uh, you see so many different things going on. And so we're going to explore this book. I think it's going to be very helpful to you. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to do uh, a little background uh, study on uh, on the book and go through it and really see uh, some of the, the highlights of why we're studying this book and also, too, to give us some a deeper understanding of why it's so important to um, really study a book like First Corinthians. And so I'm going to talk for uh, a few minutes. So if you want to take notes, all that good stuff, that'd be good. If you're watching uh, live, I'm going to share my screen so you can actually see uh, the notes, some of the notes I have on the screen. I, I'm going to try to do double duty of uh, going through the, <laughs> the PowerPoint uh, presentation as well as uh, my notes in front of me. And so hopefully I can uh, keep it, uh, keep them both on the same, uh, same uh, lens that I don't mess up too much. And so, uh, so we're going to do uh, some historical context and historical background. Uh, and then we're going to look at uh, some of the biblical texts of uh, First Corinthians and uh, explore that. So I'm going to share my screen for those of you guys who are watching, um, and then you can see my screen. You see this? All right. Let me see if I can make this big and still see you guys as well. Let's see how this looks. All right, hold on one second. One more thing, sorry, y'all. All right, I may have to do it like that. For whatever reason, my computer is like acting crazy. So hopefully you can uh, you can see everything and I'll just go through the slides like that. All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about uh, the church that belongs to Jesus. We're gonna look at 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9. Um, and the scripture that we're gonna look at uh, says this, it says, Paul called an, called an apostle, of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Sothenes, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both to their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in him in every way, in all speech, in all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was conformed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You are called by him unto fellowship with the Lord, with Jesus Christ our Lord. So as we look at the historical context of uh, the Corinthian church, or even Corinth, which we're going to look at first, first, this was a church that was riddled with all sorts of problems, but they were filled with believers. These were uh, followers of Christ. They just had a lot of issues going on, and Paul sought to deal with the issues that they were facing. Um, a lot of the biggest problem that they were facing is that they were in a context where they were almost being forced to uh, hold on to their old way of life instead of uh, clinging to Christ. And so Corinth and New Orleans, they had a lot in common. They were port cities. 
Uh, they were diverse in culture. Uh, you had a lot of religious pluralism. We're going to talk about that some too. Uh, in Corinth, there was an elevated part of the city that had a shrine to the Greek god uh, Aphrodite. In fact, uh, if you see on your screen there, you can see uh, these are ruins uh, in Corinth uh, of a temple to Aphrodite. And then, of course, you can see here uh, the goddess Aphrodite, which they worshipped as well. So the Greek god Apollos, uh, you know, Aphrodite, they had temples there and they would worship these idols. Uh, and this was a huge business uh, within the city of Corinth. So the temple had prostitutes that would come down and position and, and position the men or proposition the men to sleep with them. So they had all this stuff going on there. Now Corinth was known to the point to where uh, they had a phrase in the first century which was called to be Corinthianized. And so uh, just think of a city that ha had so much immorality that it had a, its own name. I mean, you know, to Corinthianize, that was the idea to describe the immorality in that day. So in this culture and, and climate, instead of uh, maturing in the things of God, many of the people actually continue just to hold on to their old pagan ways. So this is why Paul uh, deals with so much of these things with the Corinthians, because they kept going back uh, into the world. They kept holding on to a lot of their old pagan ways, and this was an issue. Um, and so, so much of the things that Paul tells them, um, he says in, in, in no short terms, he actually says this, and we're going to see this as we walk through the text, that uh, they were doing things that even those who are outside the family of God would not even do. Uh, in fact, one of the major things, this wasn't the only thing, this was like one of the things, was that you had a, uh, a man sleeping with his uh, stepmother. And so this was... Uh, man, this is some big deal that were going on. I mean, they were doing some shameful things, and yet they were calling themselves followers of Christ. And so Paul really sets out to make all these things right. So the city of Corinth was located in what we would call modern-day Greece. Uh, this is actually a picture of Corinth right there. You can see it, uh, the, the old city of Corinth, and you see the ruins uh, all over here and, and all over there. So we see some of the ruins of Corinth there. Um, and so it was uh, in modern day Greece near two ports, which it controlled. Uh, and Corinth was wealthy uh, because of its commerce. And so it was situated on uh, an isthmus or like, you know, just a, a thin piece of land there. Uh, and it was a part of uh, two harbors. And so you had all this wealth coming in, in through. Now, there's a Roman historian, uh, a Roman historian, his name is, was uh, Strabo. And he writes this. He says um, they, they were on two major shores. Uh, two major uh, harbors, and he goes on to say one which leads straight to Asia and the other to Italy, and it makes it easy, uh, the exchange of merchandise from both countries that are so far uh, distant from each other. So even then, they had an, a massive, massive amount of wealth coming through the city. Now, although they had an, a massive amount of wealth, there were still a lot of disparities within uh, the culture as well. So don't just think that, oh, this was a, uh, you know, this wealthy uh, nation of people, a group of people, there was a lot of disparities as well. Now, when we look at Corinth and we look at some of the uh, history of Corinth, we see uh, that it was destroyed in 146 BC. Uh, that was the first time it was destroyed. So it was a Greek city at first, uh, destroyed in 146 BC. Uh, then in 44 BC, uh, Julius Caesar reestablished it uh, as a Roman uh, city, so as a Roman colony. Uh, now, it had about 80,000 to 100,000 inhabitants. So this is a, a, a pretty major city, uh, if you would think of it that way. However, within the culture, they worship many gods. So they were pluralistic, just like our society. We have a society that's a very pluralistic society. Uh, we have a society where many people worship many different gods. Uh, and so this is the culture that we live in as well. So they had a great theater, they had athletics, they had other activities to keep them really occupied. It sounds like we're describing our country. It sounds like we're describing exactly the context in which we live. Now in the ancient world, uh, many people worshiped uh, multiple deities. So even in Judaism, this idea of a monotheistic God, like one God, uh, was foreign because people uh, saw that as awkward. They saw that as, uh, you know, something that didn't fit with the current cultural uh, system. So people worship many gods. 
Uh, they didn't believe in worshiping uh, many gods, actually distracted them from uh, honoring any god in particular. So this pluralistic society was one that Christians lived in. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up and all this background is that when you understand some of the historical context, as you read what Paul is saying, it gives you a greater idea of why he's addressing some of the things that he's saying and also how our Christian life should contrast uh, those in the world system, which we used to be a part of. So the reason this is important is because Christians stood out like a sore thumb in the first century. Uh, and they stood out because they exclusively worshiped Jesus. Now, according to Justin Martyr, um, who was another historian, and we get a lot of, uh, we can read a lot of his writings. Justin Martyr stated that Christians were branded as atheists. And the reason why Christians were branded as atheists in this context, I remember the context is, is pluralistic. So people worship multiple gods. Christians were branded as atheists is because they had no temple, they had no sacrifices that they were doing, they had no purity laws. I mean, like the Jews, they had no Sabbath laws. And now they're saying, hey, we're worshiping uh, Christ. We're worshiping, uh, you know, Christ who is above all, who was risen from the dead and he was crucified and now he's alive and he performed miracles. When you start looking at it in this context, you can see why uh, so many in the first century and why Christians stood out like a sore thumb. But they not only just stood out as a sore thumb because of this, but because of the works that they did as well. So they were doing the works of God for the glory of God, and they stood out like a sore thumb. First Peter tells us that as well. So the Corinthian believers were tempted to compromise with the mores of the culture. They were tempted to compromise with the Roman world. And, and since it, why were they tempted to do this, right? Because really we're looking at this is really compromise and conflict. That was going on. It was, it was compromise going on in the church, conflict going on in the church. And so you had a lot of group, a group of people that were just willing to compromise. Why? Because it's hard to be an outsider. It's hard to be an outsider within a culture that is saying, hey, look, if you're an outsider, it's going to cost something. It's going to cost you something. Now, isn't that interesting? Because that's the same thing that Jesus calls us to be. First Peter 2 tells us the idea that we're uh, aliens, we're resident aliens of this world system, that we're passing through, that while we're in this world system, we're called to do the greater good for the glory of God. And so we see all this going on, and this is where the believers are. Remember Jesus said, he said, look, Father, I pray that you don't take them out of the world, but that while they're in the world, you would keep them, you would sustain them. And it is true. Those whom God has uh, given to Christ, none of them will be lost. Christ holds us, he keeps us, he sustains us, but he leaves us in the world to not compromise our faith, but so that we can remain steadfast and immovable in him and live out for the glory of God. And so Paul how do we get to Corinth, right? So we have this background, right? Paul is coming into this culture. I love how the first century, second century Christians throughout the centuries, if you're really living for Christ, you're going to go where God calls you to go. You're not going to be afraid to go where God is said to go. And so Paul, led by God, the Holy Spirit, if you go and open your Bible, and you can do this later on, if you read Acts 18, 1 through 18, you get the whole background of how the Corinthian church started. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through it a little bit. Acts 18, 1 through 18, uh, the Jews were kicked out of Rome because the emperor at that time, Claudius, in AD 49, uh, said that they were disrupting society. Uh, so all this stuff was going on. Uh, you know, Paul comes, he goes to uh, Corinth. Uh, the Jews are there. Uh, you have uh, this, this ragtag bunch of Gentiles, and Paul goes there and preaches the gospel. So let's look at this first really fast, and I'm, I'm going to walk through it. The first thing we see here in verse 1, as we got in the background, let's get to the text now. We see in verse 1, we see the apostle Paul. So Paul is writing to the church, uh, and he's reestablishing for them uh, his apostleship or who he is, right? So we get some of the stuff that's going on. We get some of the background. And now he's writing to the church in this culture. Okay, so it says, Paul called an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will 
and Sothenes, our brother. Uh, the Corinthian church was planted by Paul again. Uh, Acts 18, Paul comes to Corinth. He finds a man named Aquila and his wife Priscilla, right? So Aquila is the man, Priscilla is the woman. Uh, and, and Paul meets this couple and he begins to hang with them. He begins to, to live with them. And he actually works with them as a tent maker. Now, the apostle Paul, although he says uh, in his writings, he says, look, he had every right like the other apostles, Peter, uh, John, different ones, to take a living from uh, the churches that he planted and the church that he supported. But he, was, he had a conviction that he didn't want to do that. And so he was a tent maker. And this is what he did with his life, making tents with uh, Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth. And as custom, Paul would often go to the synagogue and talk to the Jews about Jesus as the Messiah. So this was Paul's common place. He'd go into a city, he'll have uh, probably some companions with him, and he begins to go into the synagogue and proclaim Jesus Christ, him crucified. Now, here's the problem. In Acts 18, as the church is getting started, it got so bad uh, where Paul got so fed up because the Jews just refused to hear anything about Jesus. They just, day after day, Paul's preaching, he's preaching, he's preaching, and the Jews just reject the message of Christ completely. So Paul says this in Acts 18. He says, look, uh, I'm going to dust, I'm going to dust the dust from my shoulder, from my feet, of course, signifying this reality that, hey, look, I I'm done. I'm moving on. And so he then goes to preach to the Gentiles. So the non-Jews, he goes to the non-Jews and begins to preach about Jesus. Now, as God and his sovereignty would have it, uh, Paul then actually sees uh, many Gentiles come to faith in Christ. Uh, the Corinthians, uh, the Gentiles there begin to respond. And not only do they respond, but we learn later that uh, one of the synagogue leaders who Paul mentions here, Sothenes, comes to faith in Christ. Now, he pays for it because he's beaten, and I'll talk about that a little later. But Paul then spends an entire year preaching the gospel at Corinth, a whole year just pouring into the people, preaching the gospel continually helping them to grow their faith, to know more about Christ. And Paul was called as an apostle. He was called by Jesus. We see the calling of Paul. You can go back to Acts and see that, to reach the Gentiles with the gospel. This was his purpose. Now, Paul loved the Jewish people. He cared for the Jewish people. Yet God, in his rich mercy and providence, called him to reach the Gentiles. Now, Paul was an apostle. An apostle simply is this. It's just a sent one. That's, that's all it is. It's a, it's a sent one. And so Paul was sent by Jesus. Now, Paul is called an apostle, not just because he was a sent one, but Paul was called an apostle for the reality that he saw personally Jesus with his eyes. So the truth is, those who actually continue to hold to this idea that they are apostles today, in the sense like Paul and John and Peter were, are definitely mistaken because really one of the major marks of being an apostle was to be, number one, to see Jesus face to face, to be called by him in that way. And so Paul was indeed an apostle. I guess you would say apostle with a big A. So he's called by Jesus, goes to reach the Gentiles, he's in Corinth, and notice he starts his letter writing to introduce himself as an apostle of the Lord. So Paul then exerts his authority in this letter to the church that they would take heart about what he was going to share with them. Now, he wants them to take heart because he loves them. Now, think about this. Paul spends an entire year there. So he's not writing as somebody who doesn't care about the people. He's writing as someone who immensely cares about the people and who immensely wants to see the people of God mature in the faith, to know more about Christ, to not go the way of the world. So Paul loves the people. And that's how you know when somebody loves you is when they teach you and point you to the truth, right? They may not do all the things that you want them to do, but are they pointing you to the truth of Christ? And this is what Paul did. So Paul then exerts his authority. He exerts his authority in this letter to the church that they would take heart. And I love this. Paul then includes his brother Sothenes. And, and Sothenes was the Jewish synagogue leader that came to faith in Christ, and he was beaten up for it. Uh, and so we see this brother now whose life has been transformed, and now he's 
rolling with Paul. He's living and doing ministry and doing life with Paul to the glory of God. Now, as we get into the text, we see verse 2 talks about this idea of being set apart, okay, being set apart. Again, it says, it says this, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Before we get into many of the issues the church has, which they did, and they had a lot of issues, uh, I love how Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he reminds the church who they really are. He says, look, uh, don't forget who you, who, who you are. You are those who are sanctified or set apart. Uh, you're called as saints, called as saints with every other believer, right? Every other believer. And even for us, we can use reminders like this often. We can use reminder like, reminders like this on a daily basis. This is a reminder of not only whose we are, but who he's called us to be. Notice, he doesn't use, uh, you know, language that says, hey, you're becoming saints, or, you know, one day you'll be saints. No, you're called as saints. You're set apart in Christ Jesus. These are realities of who we are in Christ. And why are we this? It's because of the finished work of Christ. It goes directly back to what Jesus has done, not what we can do. Now, remember, the culture, remember the background we just talked about. The culture that they're in is corrupt and it's immoral to the core, right? Peter talks about this much in his writing to the church of these you once were, right? You were in darkness. Now you've come into the marvelous light. You were once not the people of God, but now you are the people of God. This is all throughout the New Testament. This is why we have to keep our hearts and our minds and our, and our focus on Christ because it points us to what he's done, the finished work of Christ that he's called us unto himself and we are the people of God. Now, Paul says, remember the context we're talking about, the culture is corrupt, it's immoral, they're in darkness, but he says they're sanctified in Christ. So when we have a new life in Christ, we now belong to him. Now, this is such a simple statement, I know. Like, you're like, yeah, I know that. Like, yeah, for sure. I know the moment you come to Jesus, now you belong to him. But no, this is very much an important statement that he's making because no longer do our lives belong to us. So we should say to the Lord, like, my life is yours. I have to do with it as you see fit. Remember the disciples asking Jesus to teach them how to pray? What, what did they say? Jesus says, look, Pray this way, not my will, but yours be done. Galatians 2.20, I no longer live, but it is Christ now who lives in me. So we die to our old life. We have a new life. We've been sanctified. We've been set apart. I'll make one note here as well. I think in uh, oftentimes, especially in the American church context, because of certain uh, kind of theological nuances and in, in ways of thinking, when we talk about someone being anointed, we often use and throw that term around. But in 1 John, it tells us that the anointing is actually having the Holy Spirit. So in a sense, every believer is anointed. If you, if you are born again, you are anointed. You are set apart. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we see this reality here. You are sanctified. And so Paul here is telling the church, look, hey, guys, you, you've been made holy by the Lord Jesus Christ. And now you belong to him for his service. You see why the context is so important? It's because, hey, look, I know these folks are all, all over there. They're worshiping Aphrodite and Apollos. You know, I, I know these folks are over here doing X, Y, Z, but not you. Because why? You have are those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, and you're called as saints. You see how I'm saying that historical context helps you to understand why the Lord is, is uh, speaking in this way to us through the Apostle Paul. And so he's saying to them, look, you've been made holy. You belong to him for his service. So our purpose lies here as well. So we belong to him. We've been set apart for his use. Think about it this way. There are no um, like non-useful people who are in the kingdom of God. If you are born again, You've been sanctified, you've been set apart for his use, and guess what? 
our use is for his glory. So there's no Christian that can say, I have no use for the Lord. That's why it's a shame that in a local church, and we're going to get to spiritual gifts later on, it is a shame, though, that in many local churches, only 10% of the people carry the load. Really, it should be whatever gift you have, use for the glory of God. Whatever God has called you, whatever God has given you, seek ways to use it for his glory. Why? Because other people are blessed for it. So our purpose is there as well. We belong to him. We've been set apart for his use. Now, I love this. He says they were called to be saints. They were called to be saints. Now, this is not the saint like we're used to hearing about, right? A, a person who's elevated to some supreme place and then pray to. This is not anything the scripture teaches. It doesn't teach any of that. In short, Paul was saying this. He was saying that you've been set apart and are God's people. You're a saint. That, this is synonymous. He's just using the same thing. You're set apart. You're God's people. You are a saint. Now, you're invited into this relationship with Christ, right? And now this assembly of people who are now uniquely called to live a holy, pure, and consecrated life for his glory. That's the ecclesia or the church. This is what it is. It's the called out ones. This is why we have to remember, especially in the context we live in, that we are indeed the called out ones. We're the ecclesia. We are the assembly. We're the called out ones. We've been called out from the darkness into the light. Now, when we understand theology as well, theology problem, we understand that according to Ephesians 2, none of us can boast about being called out because we couldn't call our own selves out. It was God's grace and his mercy. So we humble ourselves and we say, Lord, thank you for calling us now into your family. Thank you for calling us saints who are going to call, who will live holy, pure, and consecrated lives for your glory. Now, it goes on to say, right there, it says, look, you're sanctified in Christ, called as saints with all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're called together with all those other saints. We're called together with every other person who's calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it any wonder that the devil, the evil one, tries to come in and make a church disunified? Part of the problem in the Corinthian church. And we're going to read about it later on as we go on in this study uh, in the next coming weeks, is that this church was greatly divided. Some were choosing Paul, some were choosing uh, Apollo, some were choosing this one, some would say, I'm, I'm following Jesus. They were greatly divided, but yet we're called to be one in Christ because we're called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, some people, of course, today will love to say, well, look, I get the whole idea of being a Christian, being born again. I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm going to do all this on my own. But the text even here points us to this reality that we're called as saints with all those, all those in every place. So you can't do this on your own. There, there is no such thing as Lone Ranger Christianity. And here's another part, too. The people of God are the people of God. Now, the, the thing that I'm concerned about, I won't talk about it here, and I won't even go, because I won't have time to really touch on all this, but in our cultural context, November is coming up, and we know what that means. When the election time comes up, it's all of a sudden we have spiritual amnesia that we are, what this says, sanctified, called as saints with all those. That means every other believer. That means that even if someone thinks different or votes different or, or, or does something different from you, are they saints of God and are they called with you as well? We have to remember that, that we're believers set on purpose and called to one another for his unique purpose, for his glory. So Paul is saying to the believers, he's saying, look, before I get into the heart of all I'm going to talk to you about and all I'm going to say in this letter uh, and all the intent I'm saying, I want you to know and remember whose you are and who you are, right? What you've been called to, who you belong to. Uh, in the midst of all the chaos and all the immorality around you, remember. I think that's a good reminder to us as well. I mean, with all the things going on around us and all the chaos that's happening uh, on social media, on the news, yes, we should be informed. Yes, we should know all these things. 
But we have to remember, we can't develop a spiritual amnesia and forget that we have been sanctified. We have been called saints with all those in every place who are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can't forget who we are, who we are, and who we're called to be. And it does get difficult to live a holy and right life. But the, the truth is, is that it's Christ has paid the price for us. And so we don't live out a holy life or a life that's sanctified in our own strength. In fact, we do we live holy to the Lord in an immoral culture because we love God, right? Do we always hit the mark every moment? No, we don't. First John tells us when we do sin, we have, uh, we have an advocate with the Father. We can come to him and find forgiveness of our sins. So even when we stumble, we, his grace and his mercy is there. But the aim, the walk of the Christian is to live like Christ, is to live and follow his commands and to strive for his glory, not to earn salvation, not to earn our place in heaven, but because of what he has done. And this is the great preface that, that Paul is giving us here. This is the great thing that he's showing us here. And, and he's saying, look, many people, and he's pointing to us here, is that you've strayed away. <laughs> they strayed away uh, from this within the church. All right, let's look at verse three, all right? This is what I don't get to do on Sunday. We get to slow down and walk through all this stuff, right? So verse three, we see this idea, right? So first we saw Paul, the apostle, he sets out his authority as an apostle. Then he says, look, you've been set apart, right? Holy, sanctified, set apart. But then look at this in verse three, you've been united, united. I mean, you can just hear, even from the text and the context, this love that Paul is literally oozing for these people. And that's how you know, like Paul is not in it for the money. He's not in it for the fame. He loves people, which is why you see early on in Acts, why the apostles set aside deacons to do the, some of the work that they were getting tied up with so that they can pray and get into the word so they can teach the people of God what the word of God says. So verse number three, he says, the grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is talking to, in a very, and I use this term, and I don't think it really even uh, uh, effectually kind of categorizes where they are. He's really speaking to a dysfunctional group of people here. Uh, he, he's speaking peace over them. And when I say dysfunctional, not saying that they, they weren't in Christ, but they were, they were all over the place. They had all kinds of things where they were arguing about different leaders. They were, had, they were allowing someone who had a sinful lifestyle just to run amok among them. They were arguing over spiritual gifts. All this stuff is going on, and he speaks peace over them. He says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. This is a greeting that he does with this. And he's stating this is what they needed, is that they needed the goodwill and the unity to break forth among them. And as a church, God has called us to have a unified front. Now, oneness doesn't necessarily mean sameness in the sense of some of the other ideas we may have. Uh, look, somebody may have this idea about global warming. You may have this idea. It doesn't, that those things really are not uh, first tier things. He's calling them to be unified in Christ, right? Calling them to be unified and one in the Lord. And so we're called to pray and to serve and to love together, but also to be one in the Lord Jesus Christ. And where there's this unity, distrust, dysfunction will prevail. Wherever there's this unity, wherever there's this trust, dysfunction is going to prevail. So our witness to the world is the unity that we have in the body, right? You know them by their, the love they have for one another. And so we're called to have this unity in the body of Christ with one another. And this is a great reason to see a church that is ethnically, socioeconomically diverse. Remember the context? Remember we talked about the context a little bit, that Corinth was a very rich, uh, prosperous place, but it wasn't all like that. They had an immense uh, amount of slaves there. They had a bunch of Gentiles and Jews. So this church at Corinth was very much diverse as well. You had Jews, Gentiles, those who had much, those who had little, this was a hodgepodge of people, but that is what the kingdom of God is. And this is why Paul continued to say, in Christ, there's neither Jew, nor Greek, nor, nor male, nor female. It is not that he was saying, hey, look, 
no longer see your distinctions, like your distinctions that disappear. He wasn't saying that. But what he's saying is that, look, those things now pale in comparison to being one in Christ. And so we are one in Christ and we walk that out together. And so this church was uniquely diverse. It was diverse in people, it was diverse in gifts. And Paul is saying, look, grace to you, peace to you, be unified in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he says, look, grace, let's look at that, that word grace there, right? Verse number four, he goes on to say, I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God, grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. A great reason to rejoice in any church is that people in the church actually know and follow Jesus. Remember, we talked about the ecclesia, the called out ones. A church is only a church or an assembly, the ecclesia, the called out ones, is when it's filled with born again believers. Sometimes we get it backwards, right? We say, well, we have a church if people are coming, but if everybody, you know, if, if you're saying members are not born again, then really, what do you have? No, it's the called out ones. And so Paul says, look, I, I, th I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace that God has shown you. And so Paul focuses in on the real reason to be thankful, despite all the craziness going on, despite all the things that were happening among them, was this, God's grace was poured out. God's grace was poured out. And these people had experienced the forgiveness of Jesus in their lives. Paul keeps going back to Christ. He keeps going back to the gospel. He keeps going back to that one place. Pointing, look, God, don't forget the grace of God, the mercy of God, what Jesus Christ has done. And despite what may be going on in the church or around us, our hearts also should yearn for lives to be reached with the gospel as well. Now, this should be the cry of our heart and a reason we should be giving God all the glory, that those who are away, those who are in the darkness, are coming to faith in Christ. And this is what Paul is saying. Look, I give thanks to God for you because you have now experienced the grace of God. You've now experienced the mercy of God. You've experienced now Jesus Christ and what he's done in the finished work on the cross. Now, think of this in this way. Remember, we're going back to the historical context here we talked about earlier. Paul labored there in Corinth for an entire year. Now, he labored for an entire year, and now he writes back with his, his, his brother in the faith, uh, Sothenes, who was the, the synagogue leader, who has been set free, and he's writing to those who now belong to Jesus. I mean, this is a labor of love that, that we're really pointing to. They have been shown the grace of God. And here's the thing. I was on a phone call today with uh, the Ethics, Ethics and Religious Liberty uh, Council. I'm a part of uh, their leadership uh, team uh, with Dr. Russell Moore. And he was sharing a story uh, today about um, seven years ago when he was um, placed into the position of the president of the ERLC. And he was sharing how when he looked at a picture on his Instagram page, how he saw um, two people there who uh, were once, you know, say they were followers of Christ and now they're atheists. And, and he began to, you know, really kind of tear up. The thing is, is that people who really love Jesus love people and they want people to continue to walk with Jesus. Uh, they want to see people truly uh, born again. And this is what we see Paul saying there. And I think that should be our story as well, especially in the climate and the time we find ourselves in, is that Lord, help us to be a people that give thanks because of the grace of God given to people and shown to people. Let that be us, that we're the people who are pouring and pointing people to the grace and mercy of God. And because we know the gospel transformed lives. Now look at this. Let's keep going on. In verse number six, we see this idea of richness, right? Richness. So let me recap. We have Paul addressing himself as an apostle. We talked to them about being set apart. We talked about them being united. We said, man, they've been shown the grace of God. And now he's talking about the richness of Christ. And look what it says. It says that you were enriched in him in every way, in all speech, in all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in Jesus, 
we not only receive the future promises, but the present realities. We receive the present realities right now. We receive spiritual gifts and, and, and all these things. We receive wisdom and knowledge. And this is what Paul is talking about. He tells them, look, you were lacking or not. They're not lacking in any gift, right? They were rich, as one pastor put it, in, in preachers, uh, are the, the preaching of the word. They are rich in knowledge and understanding of it. Remember the context there? Corinth, rich port city. Uh, that many things coming in. You have the temple uh, of Aphrodite and uh, Apollos there. You have all of these things around them. And Paul brings them back to remember, look, I know what you see, but what you see out there in the world system pales in comparison to what you have in Jesus Christ. They had the word of God. And, and guess what? He wanted them to respond accordingly to that instead of what they were seeing on the outside. They were so much enriched by Christ that they had gifts prevalent in the church, wisdom, great understanding of the mysteries of God. It's like this. Imagine having all you need right here, but yet you keep saying the grass is greener on the other side. This is what was happening in the church. They were so enamored by the culture that was outside, and they were saying, well, look, the grass must be greener that way. And Paul said, no. You have been enriched in Christ. There's nothing that they can offer you out there. Jesus himself says, look, I'll never leave you nor I'll forsake you, right? I'm there with you, right? He's promised to be with us. Proverbs 10, says this, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and add no, adds no sorrow with it. And so Jesus gives us all we need. So there is no need to return back to the world. This is why I started off with that rich historical context, because you see why Paul keeps kind of hitting on this point over and over again. Why? They were once in darkness. Now they've come to the light. The world in itself offers only this, sorrow, pain, temporary hope, pleasure, and temporary peace. Christ gives joy, hope, and this hope is everlasting. This is why, while some of the world's solutions can be good and beneficial, let's not miss that. Some of the world's solutions can be good and beneficial, but they still come short because Christ is the one who offers full reconciliation between people. Christ is the only one who offers not only eternal hope, but hope in the midst of every struggle you may face. Christ is the only one who answers to the problem of injustice and suffering and all these things. It is found in him. So this is why, as believers, we can't get pulled away and we should stay firm in him. And so, as believers, though, we walk in and out the promises of God now as well as in the days to come, in the future to come, in as we wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the, the, the eschaton, the, the coming, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the richest thing we can have is the revelation or illumination of his word and the knowledge to live it out. I don't know if you know this about yourself or given thanks for this, but if you were born again, you are much, much, much privileged to know the truth of Christ. Don't allow the world to tell you that you don't have something because you don't have something material or something uh, that you feel like you should have and you don't have. No, in Christ, we have the richness of knowing him. We have him. We have all the spiritual blessings that we can have, and it's found in him. But as we come to a close, look at this. We only have two more, two more verses to go. Verse 8, he talks about being firm, being firm, being firm. All right, look at verse 8. It says, he will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus calls us to relationship with him. He cleans us up. He calls us holy. He calls us his saints. He enriches us with all that we need and then promises to sustain us until he comes back. Now, ask yourself this question. Can you do that on your own? 
And that's what we keep coming back to. We, we preach this every Sunday and week in and week out. We could not save ourselves. We can't keep ourselves. It is in Christ. He enables us to walk. He gives us the power. He gives us the strength to walk these things out. And so he says, I will sustain you. I will keep you and give you strength. I'll keep you until I return. Literally, this, in the original language, this literally just, he's simply saying, look, I want to make you firm and stable in faith. I want to make you firm and stable in faith. So God has the power to help us stand firm and remain firm in him. Many Christians will struggle with this because they feel like, oh, okay, I, I don't feel like a saint. I don't feel uh, as if I'm forgiven, but we, we're not led by our feelings. We're led by our faith. And remember, faith is simply, biblical faith is simply trusting in Christ. It is just trusting in what he's done and the finished work of the cross. We're looking to him. And so we're living out our daily walk. We're living out our daily life in soul dependence on him, not us. So he has the power to keep us, to sustain us until he returns or until we meet him face to face. In other words, the assurance of the believer is not that, as John Piper says it, it's not that God will save him if he stops believing, but that God will keep him believing. <laughs> That's good news. God sustains us and keeps us going. He holds us and gives us that strength. So we're, we're not saying, look, God, let me muster this up. No, if, if we trusted Jesus to save us from our sin, then we're going to trust him to keep us and walk with us. This is the good news that we have in Christ. So don't fall back into trying to earn your way to heaven or working, uh, say, oh man, I'm working to try to earn uh, something from God. No, we do good works because we have been forgiven. And so Paul is telling them this. So we are called to live and love God with all our heart, our soul, mind, and strength. We're called to live and please him for his glory. And so in Christ, we are one in him. And here's how he ends it, all right? And then I open it up for questions and everything uh, after this, right? So we're called to rest in the finished work. And he's powerful enough to redeem us. He's powerful enough to keep us. But he closes it this way as we go, we're going to stop here uh, for uh, this part of the study. We are called. We're called. All right. Let me look back over it again. Remember, we're set apart, united. We have the grace of God. We have the richness of Christ. He keeps us firm. And now we see we are called. Verse number nine, God is faithful. You are called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, God the Father has no second class children in Christ. You belong to him, all right? There is no hierarchy in the family of God. There's not like, hey, here's pastors, here's other people, here's, you know, this one or that one. No, uh, there's a coming day when Jesus will return that he will present us faultless before the throne of God. And he is faithful to those whom he has called to those who are his. So I love this. One, one pastor said it this way, God takes his paternity seriously. So those who are his, he knows who's are, who are his. He's, those who are his, he is called before the foundation of the world to himself, not based on anything we could do, not based on anything we could muster up, but by his grace and by his mercy. And the promise is that we'll be just like him and be with him forever. We have to understand that God is faithful. The one who began a good work in us is the one who will finish the work in us and his word will accomplish what it's set out to do now he was faithful to send his son if he was faithful to send his son he is faithful to keep us in his son and so god is faithful we were called by him into fellowship with his son think of it this way and matthew says this jesus tells his disciples very plainly he says look you didn't choose me right i chose you I chose you. Why do we love him? Because he first loved us. 
This is the beautiful news that we have in Christ. Philippians 1, 6, last verse. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus, or at the day of Jesus Christ. All right, we're going to end there for now. Uh, so we're going to pick up next week uh, looking at more of this. But right now, I want to open it up for any questions, comments, or anything like that in uh, the last moments we have together. Prayerfully, this was helpful for you as we start off on a study of First Corinthians. So if you have questions, you can open up your mic and then um, ask away. All right, maybe that means I did a really good job or a really bad job. I'm just gonna assume I did a really good job on that. You did a good job, Pastor Ryan. This was awesome. Awesome, awesome, praise God. All right, well, next week we will pick back up with our study in 1 Corinthians. Uh, if you missed the first part of this, uh, do not fret. Uh, I did record it, and so uh, I'll upload it to uh, a YouTube page in the next uh, few minutes, and um, I'll upload it for the next few minutes, and so I'll have all the, um, you'll see the slides and everything like that uh, on there. Uh, if you missed some of the uh, historical context and everything like that, uh, that'll be up there, uh, but hopefully you can join me next week. Uh, it's going to be really good as we walk through this, uh, especially when we start getting into uh, some of the topics on spiritual gifts, uh, tongues, um, you know, all that good stuff. Um, and I know uh, those can be kind of contentious, but we're going to uh, study all that and, uh, and everything. And uh, we'll have some other folks teaching as well uh, when I'm not teaching. And so um, it should be really good. Well, if you uh, would, let me close us out in a word of prayer. Uh, we'll pray, and then uh, we'll um, we'll meet back next week, 6.30, invite a friend to join you, uh, and it's going to be real good as we walk through it. So let me pray. Father, I thank you so much that uh, we have been called, we've been chosen, Lord, we've been set apart. Uh, help us, Lord, in the culture that we live in to not forget that. Lord, uh, so many things are pulling at us. Uh, with uh, things going on in politics, things going on in our culture. Lord, and sometimes we, for, we can forget, Lord, we're called to go and do good works. We're called to have our eyes open to the community around us. And we're called to be salt and light, uh, to engage in a culture that is in darkness. Father, help us not to be afraid. Help us not to walk in fear. But Lord, you've called us the saints of God. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to truly walk out and be the saints of God, even if it costs us something. God, help us to follow examples like Sothenes, who we just read about, who was a leader of the synagogue and left all of that to follow Jesus and to be a companion of Paul and to really live out his life for the glory of God. Lord, we want to do the same thing and do it for your glory. God, I pray your blessing on everyone who's on this video, on this call. Would you bless them in Jesus' name? Amen. All right, everybody. Well, I, like I said, I upload this to uh, YouTube, and uh, hopefully we see you either online or we'll see you uh, back next week um, for uh, our continue on in uh, Corinthians. So see you Sunday online or in person. Uh, you guys have a blessed one. We'll see you next time.